delivery driver show up at my business, and it was Amy's driver. Now, Amy owns the Armstrong McCall Beauty Supply, and so they su supply beauty products throughout our area, and so they came by my office. I thought it was interesting. I wasn't fixing hair. And the driver has this couple of boxes of Girl Scout cookies. I go, I didn't remember ordering good Girl Scout cookies. Now, I've ordered a lot from Savannah, her daughter, and I thought I already got what I ordered, but here were some more. And then he goes, and here's your bill. <laughs> now, I don't remember ordering these cookies. I don't know what they're doing, but if Amy says I ordered them, I did. So I wrote the check. And then I got to thinking, I can't eat all these cookies. So I got to figuring out who I was going to give them away to. And, well, yeah, you'd want them too, wouldn't you? Yeah. And about the time I'm getting ready to load them back in my vehicle a few days later, Linda Kellogg shows up in my office. Where are my cookies? Uh, they're my cookies. I paid for those cookies. She says, no, I order, I, I, when Amy has over a lot, I buy so I can give away at 42 places, senior living place. So that was very gracious of Linda. And so Linda gave me $85 for my 84, so that was $1 storage fee. There you go. <laughs> and Savannah has more cookies this morning. If you'd like to see her after church, she'd love to sell you some Girl Scout cookies. So that's great. Good to see you, Savannah and Joshua. Yes. You know, many people want their life to count. We want to make a difference. We don't want to just go through the motions and just put in time. We really want to be fruitful. We want to make a difference in this world. We don't want to waste our time. It's interesting, the United States has only about 10% of the world's population, only about 7% of the land mass in the world, and yet we provide and produce 80% of all goods in the world. Amen. You talk about a productive bunch of people, it's those who live in the United States of America. We get things done because we're one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So we make a difference. We were founded on these principles and our country should continue on these principles. Now, fruitfulness is required by God and it is for the productive life. Now, the Bible makes it clear that he doesn't want you just going through the motions. He wants you to make a difference in this world. Now, there's a Greek word in the Bible, korpos. Korpos, it tells us to be fruitful. And so if we're going to be fruitful now, by the way, it's 66 times in the Bible it's found. So it's something that is many times in the New Testament. He wants us to be fruitful and make a difference. Consider John chapter 15 and verse 8. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. So if we want to be, have great glory to God, we need to make sure we are fruitful in our lives. Now consider this. Bearing fruit brings glory to God. That's your first fill in there in your notes. Bearing fruit brings glory to God. The Bible has a goal that we should all, what, as believers, bring glory to God. And so how we live our life reflects what we believe. It's one thing for a person to say, well, I believe this, and they do the opposite. No, I want to see what you believe by what you do. In fact, if you're living your life as you should before God, you shouldn't have to say, well, this is what I am, because you're already living it. Absolutely. And people can see the evidence of your life. Amen. And being very productive brings what? Glory to God. And bearing fruit shows that I am a disciple. Bearing much fruit shows that I'm being, I am a disciple. Frankly, it's the proof you're part of the church family. You're part of God's family. Because when you're saved as a believer, you're adopted into God's family. You're the ecclesia. See, the, the, the word we get for church is ecclesia, which means to pull out, draw out. We're drawn out from the world together as a body of Christ. And frankly, my being a disciple and being fruitful shows that I really am a disciple and not just playing a game. Consider this. Car uh, Carlos Morris, he was 
the chairman of the board of Stuart Tattle. He was at one time, one, he took his turn as the chairman of, the, of deacons at the First Baptist Church Houston. In fact, he was on the, he was the chairman that brought John Bassanio to the First Baptist Church of Houston on the search committee. That was back in 1972. And of course, the rest is history. Tremendous growth. Now, being the family that owns Stuart Title, now they have now put it into corporations and so forth. Incredibly wealthy person. But I got to know him on a personal level because, of all things, I repaired his cars, just like John Massano many years ago. And here this extremely powerful, wealthy man could not have been more gracious to me, kind, looked down for me, and he served on my ordination committee. And he served on Billy Graham's board for many years. Amen. On the other side, I've known people that had absolutely nothing. And yet they would give, they would serve, they were gracious, they were kind. You know what? Both of them have equal fruit. Amen. Because God holds you accountable for the resources he's blessed you with, not with somebody else with. Amen. And so you don't look at somebody, well, they've got more than me so they can do more than me. No. You be gracious and kind with what God has given you. You conduct your life in an honorable way. And what does that? That is fruit to God that glorifies him with your life and it proves you're a disciple. So further, God wants me to bear much fruit. He doesn't want you to go, well, I've done this enough. I've done my job for a while. I'll hear people say, well, I put in my time. I've done sufficient. Well, you know, I said this is the word of the Lord. I can't find the word retirement in here. Amen. You know, I've looked hard, and I've looked for somebody to say, well, I've done all I'm supposed to. It, it, I just don't find it there. Amen. Now, God may call you to a ministry. He says, fine, you've done what you're supposed to. Now I'm going to put you in another ministry. Yeah. But he's not going to let you to sit on the sidelines and get sour and dreadful and unfruitful. Just know that. He wants you to bear much fruit. See, God is not satisfied with a little fruit. He wants you productive. Now consider this. He died for you. He rose from the grave. He's forgiven your sins. So he expects a lot out of all of us. He expects every one of us to say, I'm going to rise up and be the man or the woman God's called me to be. See, this abundance is a way that we change the world one person at a time. And as God gives us the resources needed, we can make a difference. And what's the purpose? So we can share with others. So it's not about me getting all this fruitfulness and having all this, well, look who I am and look, you know, you're less than me. Or, no, no. The reason God blesses us is so we can be a blessing to others. So we can look out for one another. So we can care for another. Consider John 15, 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So when you have accepted Christ as your Savior, God transforms you. And God's expecting you to do many things that honor Him. Now sometimes He'll call you to do things, well, I don't know if I have the time. Well, if you don't have time to do God's will, you need to cut some things out of your life so you can do the priority of God in your life. Because what's going to last forever? What you do for God and in His name. Amen. Now further, bearing fruit is the purpose of my salvation. The purpose. You know, if you accepted Christ as your Savior and you were done with anything you need to do for the kingdom of God, well, then God would just take you home to heaven. Yeah. You know, why leave you behind here to go through the world, through the pain, through the trials and things we face, if once you're saved, that's all you have to do? he just take you home. But God leaves us here as the witness, as the benefactor of his blessings, so we can show what Christ expects in the world and to transform it. And we do that out of love. What did God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life? 
God is motivated by love. And so our fruitfulness is motivated for our love for God. And how we serve other people is because we love them and we love God. So it's not like, well, we need more, so no. no. Love. And people know when there's a phony and when you're real. He knows when you're moving with him and knows when you're not. Be faithful. You realize we're all going to have a life audit. And it always staggers me when he says, and the books were open and the book of life. And we always run to the book of life. But see, those other books were open. And further it says, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. I don't know about you, but in some ways that makes me shudder. But yet the other side I read, it says, come boldly to the throne of grace and receive forgiveness and help and love What at your time of need. So you know what? When I'm going to be called before God, I'm going to remember that verse. Come boldly. Father, I'm home. I love you, right? <laughs> Let's not worry about this audit here. I don't know if that will work, but I'll try. It's kind of funny how I did my dissertation. You have to defend your dissertation. And you've got an hour, and you've got ten professors there. And they're primed to ask you crazy questions just to make you sweat. Well, the, I gave my opening statement. And then I explained everything about my dissertation. And when there's about five minutes left, I stopped and said, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fish, my professor, said, Max, you're the best one I've ever had. <laughs> Just ran out the clock. <laughs> ways to do that. So I'll just run out the clock when I get to heaven. Love you, Father. <laughs> Forgive me. God is so good. Now, further, a truly productive life is one where the fruit lasts. The fruit lasts. It's one thing to have fruit, but does your fruit last? Is there a difference in the world that you came? You know, a lot of plants have blossoms. And generally you have to have blossoms before you can have the fruit. And a lot of plants have leaves. There's a difference between activity and productivity. Leaves and blossoms are activity. Pr productivity is the fruit. And God wants to see the fruit in our lives. Now, there's many flash-in-the-pan ministries. Oh, they'll put a bunch of advertising out. They'll tell you how wonderful they are, and everything looks like it is going just incredible. They're out there, and it looks like they are successful. And they say everything right, it looks good, smells good, but you know what? Something in your spirit says, there's just something here. And the next thing you know, they're a zero where they had been a hero. They looked like they were great, and it's gone. Interesting. Consistent day in, day out serving over the long haul builds a great ministry. I am not the man who planted this church 14 years ago. Because for 14 years, God's been working on me every day to be a more productive pastor, to be better to honor you, better to love you, and honor the work I do for my father every day. It's interesting how over the long haul, I have been a believer for 48 years. I've served him as a pastor for 38 years, always consistently serving. I want to be able to end my life, and I stand before God, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come home. Enjoy my happiness. That's what I want to hear. Be faithful to the end. Finish your course. You finish the race. Don't slow down. You now, sometimes we look at our life and say, well, I've done all this for God. I've served him all these things. Well, I'm just going to sit and just soak it in. I don't find that in the Bible either. It says, press forward. In Philippians chapter 3, with every five years, press forward to the prize for the upward calling of Christ in your life. Don't slow down. 
There's been several instances where marathon runners could see the tape ahead and they just kind of slowed down. I've got this one. And out of nowhere, here comes somebody just flashing by them and they win the race, not the one who thought they had it run. Don't let somebody rush ahead of you in your race with God. You make sure you break that tape. You stay focused all the way to the end. The Bible tells us that a real fruitful life is incredibly productive. Not just going through the motions. Consider. I, it's not your accomplishments that matter. It's your, what lasts after you're gone. Case in point, my pastor, John Bassanio, when he came to the First Baptist Church in Houston, we were in an old, worn-out building town, town, had about 200 people, and the place could seat 2,500, and everybody was saying, sell it, give it away to missions, the money, go do something else. But Carlos Morse was burdened by God and brought John Bassanio there. And uh, after John, Brother John got there, Carlos got all the men of the church together and said, okay, men, our new pastor has a lot of crazy plans. I don't know if I understand even half of them, but I believe that he is God's man. Now, men, here is my money. Where's yours? And the men rose up as one man and gave, and so therefore they had incredible resources to do many ministries. And the proof of his ministry is you go to our 16 and I 10, there's a huge complex worth probably 20 or 30 million dollars. And the church has 8,000 to 10,000 on Sunday between their multiple services. Yeah. Now, that's a legacy that lasts. Now, when we started this church, okay, we're meeting at the school. And Mary Nichols consistently reminds me that I publicly said that I would not leave y'all to build, buy land or buildings for five years. But then we didn't have anywhere to meet because the school does deep cleaning in the summer, so we couldn't be there. And the situation worked out where they couldn't have us in the fall. And there was no place to meet. And the guy said, well, what about that barn? I said, well, I know about that barn. That's my aunt, Joanne Smith. And she's getting ready to get married to Harold Urbanowski. They said, well, go talk to her. So I went over and talked to her. And she said, now remember, we had no money. She said, yeah, I'll sell. And we made all the terms. And somehow God allowed us to have the down payment. And she carried the note. If I had waited we wouldn't be here today. You know, when the convention said, well, Dr. Brandon, three or four years you have money to start a church. I said, I'm almost 50. We're not waiting any three or four years. Took the leap of faith, and because I took the leap of faith, we are here to this day with plans for the future, great plans for the future together. So I want to talk about four kinds of fruit. There's a lot of fruit we need to look at. Then the first fruit, is I've been talking about fruit, so I need to define it for you. It's one thing to talk about, another one to tell you what it is, is the fruit of repentance. Repentance. The Bible has a lot about fruit. It's literally talking about the self-centered life or the God-centered life. Are you serving God with all of your heart over here, or are you looking just to serve yourself? You say, well... Where did we find that? John the Baptist. He was out in the wilderness baptizing, and people knew he was a prophet. So the religious leaders of the day came out to show their piety, and they wanted to be baptized. And John said, uh, I want to see evidence, the fruit of repentance. And of course, they weren't going to repent of anything. They said, we don't need to do that, and they went on back to Jerusalem. The evidence in your life is repentance. You've come before God and asked God, forgive us our sins. That's the first part of your fruit. I can see a mind change, but I want to see a heart changed. Because you can memorize the Bible. You can know everything backward and forward about it, but if it's not in your heart, it's not there. Repentance says I'm turning control of my life over to God. I'm repenting of my sins. I'm accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior. And if you have not made that decision, I encourage you to do that today. Amen. And right after the service, it's your lucky day. 
I'm having Discovering Church Membership, Class 101, where the first part is about how to be a believer. Now, we bribe you because in the middle of that, we'll have lunch served. So you don't have to go eat lunch somewhere. We'll have lunch here, and we'll have the session. And it's so important, the pastor teaches that class. Because what you believe, what you know, that way you can ask the pastor directly yourself to make sure we're on the same page before God. The second fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is incredible evidence in our lives. In Galatians 5, and 23, it gives us five character qualities of this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Whenever I come to patience, I always, some people pray for patience. I don't pray for patience. I think God will give me all the patience I have to have. So I don't want to have to have extra, okay? Just what he wants. Gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. And so we always have to watch that self-control. We can get out of bounds, and we've got, to know we've got to stay within our boundaries. Now, this is the fruit of character. It's one of the fruit we have, but some people think, well, that's all the fruit. No, there's a whole lot more fruit that God has for it. That's just the fruit of character. See, the character is who you are when nobody is watching, when nobody's around. God wants you to have fruit that is the evidence of a changed life, changed character, to be more like Christ daily. And second, the fruit of bringing someone to Jesus. The fruit of bringing someone to Jesus. The fruit of a Christian leading somebody else to the Lord. Now, many people have the big fisher syndrome. They think, well, the pastor's supposed to save everybody. I'm just supposed to go to church. No, no, no. I don't find that in the Bible either. It is responsibility of every believer to be a witness to share Christ to draw people to him. And you know what, people will expect me to do that, but when you do that, you talk about credibility, yours is through the roof. Somebody said, the fruit of other people's lives is what really shows the difference God's made in you because you took what God's given you and you shared it with others. Do you realize there are two things you can't do in heaven? Yeah. David knows them. David is the chaplain at the PAC unit, yes. I don't know about you. I preached. Brother John sent me to jails and halfway houses, and I thought, yeah, I've been in tough places. Mm, they're picnic compared to the state uh, Texas Department of Corrections. No. They don't have any hope. That's why God's called you there, David. You're the light in there. But there's two things you can't do in heaven. You cannot sin. There's only believers in heaven. And so, therefore, you can't witness to anybody because they're believers. So you can't sin. You can't witness. So you might as well, you don't want to sin here, so you better be busy sharing with Jesus now with other people, telling them. Fourth, the fruit of ministry to others. What this means is being involved in serving God, how he shaped you. Now, what, what is that all about? So you have, everybody has spiritual gifts. You say, well, I don't know. Well, that's why I teach Discovering My Ministry, where I help pull out of you God's spiritual gifts, and God has gifts in you that you can use for ministry. And also your heart. What's the burden of your heart? It's one thing to say, well, I, I'm gifted, I can do this, but where's your heart? Because in life, like somebody may have a job, say, working on automobiles. But what they would love to do was help with the retreat ministry. And see, so if we go, well, you have a gift of re repairing cars, I, maybe we need just you to help other people in that. But really, your heart is another area. So I try to find what your heart is and help move in that area. And we have more. What about your abilities? Now, there's spiritual gifts, but there's also different abilities we have. And personality. You know, some people are real quiet. And some people are kind of out there like me. And God uses different personalities to affect others. And what about experiences? One thing that I find is God uses our hurts, our pains that we've been through. And he brings us alongside other people 
who are going through the hurt that we went through years before, and we can come alongside and help them through that hurt. So those hurts are not wasted because God uses them. Now, Jesus took fruit bearing very seriously. Do you realize during Passion Week, he goes by and there's a fig tree outside of Jerusalem, and they go right by it. And Jesus looks at that fig tree and starts looking around, and he doesn't see any fruit. Lots of leaves, but no fruit. And the scripture records, and he cursed the fig tree. The next day, the disciples and Jesus went right by that fig tree, and what happened? It was dead. Totally dead. You say, well, well, that's really harsh. No. He was saying that for them. He was pointing them to the nation of Israel. They were supposed to know that Jesus was the Savior. He had shared with them for three years, but they had missed the Savior. They had a lot of activity, but no fruit. We can have a lot of activity, but no fruit. You know what? A non-fruit-bearing believer, non-productive, is a contradiction. You as a believer should be producing fruit that honors God every day. Now let me tell you how seriously God takes this. In Luke 13, 7, Jesus said, and I'll, let me give a little background there. Um, this is a parable. He was talking about a man who had fig trees. And he had planted them, but he kept on working and trying with certain fig trees, and it, one didn't have fruit. So let's look at it. In Luke 13, 7, Jesus said, I, I waited three years, and there, has been, there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taken a space in the garden. So the definition of productive life is extremely clear. It's not activity. It's not, say, the leaves of the plants or the blossoms of the plant. It's the fruit that lasts. And we can be really busy doing a lot of things that, quote, honors God. But you say, well, where's the fruit? Where's the evidence that God's working with you? And so we need to make sure we don't get busy with activities and miss the core of what God wants us to do. So activity and production, totally different. You know what? I want you to be productive. I want you to have a life that lasts. And I will challenge you and encourage you to make sure you walk with God every day. Now, I have another whole sermon. But God says, I'm supposed to stop here, and you get the next half next week. Yeah, so you got to come back next week or watch it on television, yeah. Watch it, yes. Yeah, if, if I go much longer, I'm over time. And I care very much about your time. So here's the point today. Examine your life before God. See, only you and God can help you understand how productive you are. Then if you don't understand how productive and so forth, get with a, somebody that you view as a great spiritual individual, and just talk to them. And I'll give you the marks of a great spiritual person. They won't tell you what to do. They'll ask you questions that help you discover what God wants you to do. See how God works? God has great plans for us, plans to help us, not to hurt us, plans to give a hope in a future, and we have great hope in a future with him. Make sure you know Jesus as your Savior. Let him transform your life. In Jesus' name this day, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your incredible help today. We know we have so many good things to do, but help us do the most important things. Help us not draw back and miss out on your challenge. Help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us stand together for this invitation, inviting you to accept Christ your Savior or whatever spiritual decision you may have.